you know what lies beyond those trees. This is just the start of what America will become. People who come here in their thousands, all hoping to live the American dream. Is that the same as our dream? I suppose it is. The European conformity of the Shenandoah Valley really didn't kick off until 1730, despite a small German migration four years prior to and thereafter. The second and third series of land grants were eagerly encouraged by Governor Sir William Gooch. Once again, mirroring the philosophy of Ulster's plantation, these grants enticed wealthy men, both Germans as well as the English, who would bring with them families to tend to the land, much like the undertakers and their tenants. Gooch's province would briefly be enshrined as Goochland. Between the gentry class being granted land, many cleverly labeled as cavaliers, the chivalrous, swashbuckling men who were royalist followers of King Charles I battling against Parliament during the English Civil War and lost to Cromwell, and the headright system, immigrants poured into the valley. During the ten-year period, a substantial migration of the Scotch-Irish ravished the valley so much so, it became known as the Irish Tract. In fact, the jargons of redneck and hillbilly derived specifically from Ulster, bringing these identities to the Shenandoah Valley and the Appalachia Mountains, thereby transforming them from one stereotype into another. Rednecks were lowland Presbyterians who fled from Scotland to Ulster for religious reasons. They were known to have worn red scarves around their necks to signify signing their covenant in their own blood. Hillbillies were Scottish supporters of King Charles I during England's Civil War, known as Billy Boys, but in America were known more simply as Hillbillies. The Scot-Irish migration came either via Pennsylvania or directly to Virginia from Ireland, what would be referred to as the backcountry. 60% of the population arrived from Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Northern England. Considering William Buster, Bustard, settled in the area where the Scotch-Irish culture prevailed, it's easy to conclude he could have either been born in Ulster, Ireland, as some Buster prodigies were to believe, based on their ancestors' dialect, even though evidence contradicts those beliefs. As the result of William assimilating his English life by first converting to the Presbyterian ways and having two of his sons marry into the Woods clan, a certain portion of the Buster clan has thus become more Scots-Irish. And yet, it's at this very valley in which William's descendants, who merged with the Scots-Irish, established this pinnacle corner when the mixing of lineages evolved into an American singularity, the Virginian. Why were the Scotch-Irish more prevalent in the Shenandoah Valley than any other Europeans? That question requires a threefold answer. One, to escape from the English repression in Ulster. Two, unlike his staunchly elitist predecessor, Sir William Berkeley, Governor Gooch was handing out grants of land like candy and with less discrimination because Gooch was part of an emerging era when religious and economic restrictions were more open than a century before. Three, those who were brave enough to expand into the violent frontier were already used to 200 years of warfare. This is where the Woods family would continue their journey from country to country to country, finding more desirable opportunities in America. The Woods clan's history was not an exception, but rather a universal one, much like a feather from a flock flown overseas, several times over by gusts of volatile winds. The Woods originated from France, in the vicinity of Flanders, when a Sir Jean-Pierre Dubois arrived in London after the death of his wife and mother sometime in the early 1600s. The incentive of his immigration no doubt had to have been influenced by religion. Despite the religious prejudice felt in England, it was far better and safer than in France at the time. When King Henry VIII broke ties from the Roman Catholic Church in order to divorce his first wife, this gap left open for Protestants to live more peacefully, even if certain economic and political restrictions were enforced by the Anglican Church. France was the opposite. With 90% of its population being Roman Catholic, the Huguenots, who were the gentry Protestants, were outnumbered even though their wealth contributed to the preservation and the growth of its society. 
The violence caused a civil war during the 1500s, which also inflicted an economical decline for the Huguenots, inspired many to flee, including Sir Jean-Pierre Dubois. The son of Dubois, Michael Francis, anglicized their family's surname to Woods, which is a direct translation, by the time of his marriage in 1609. Two generations later, the grandson of Dubois, John Andrew Woods, nicknamed Trooper Woods, was awarded land and a castle in Meath, Ireland for his role for helping Oliver Cromwell invade Ireland in 1649. This Protestant movement, Cromwell, who was a staunch Puritan, and Woods, who had become Presbyterian but already Protestant, invested a political struggle between King Charles I, who married a Catholic, and the Anglican Parliament, fearing that the Scottish king was sympathetic to the Roman Catholic religion. Also, Parliament didn't like King Charles' financial decisions regarding taxes and wars, particularly with Ireland. The Woods survived yet another civil war, and Ireland, yet again, was just the excuse for England's power grab, granting Cromwell the right to dictate as Lord Protector after the beheading of King Charles I, leaving a 16-year monarchy vacuum for Britain until Cromwell's death in 1653. Three more generations would come to pass when father and son, the two Sir Michaels, father more known as Sir Michael Marion, immigrated first to Pennsylvania, then to Virginia by the early 1700s. To be Scotch-Irish didn't mean there had to be Irish blood, no, and ironically, quite the opposite. Due to the complicated dynamics of Northern Ireland, although the majority of the immigrant population were Scottish, however, there were also a mixture of English, Welsh, German, French, and even Dutch, settling an ulcer for either political dominance or the Huguenots fleeing from religious persecution. These foreigners established a new home, thereby creating a new ethnic identity, the Scotch-Irish, or more distinctly, the Ulsters. The Woods clans were indeed this emerging tribe. They were different from the original Scotsmen through this cultural mutation. But having lived in Ireland for several generations didn't imply they were immune to the political and economic shifts. It would be at this period they too became a part of the mass exodus. The majority of the populace came from Northern Ireland, although not exclusively because both Michael Woods came from Meath, south of Ulster, just outside of Dublin. From a glance, it would seem inconceivable to understand why a family of great wealth would forsake their hierarchy rights for another continent where there would be no guarantees of maintaining nor expanding their prestige to their heirs. After all, Trooper John Woods married Lady Isabella Bruce of Scotland, direct descendant from Edward the Bruce, High King of Ireland, and brother to Robert the Bruce. Sir Michael Marion Woods married Lady Mary Margaret Catherine Campbell of the Scottish Campbells, supporters who were favored by King James I. And Elizabeth Woods married into the noble Highland Wallace clan. Their future may have appeared comfortable and secure, but the climate reversed its progression while battling with a series of misfortunate circumstances. In 1707, the Scottish Parliament consolidated with the English to extend political privileges, thusly officially declaring Britain as the United Kingdom. This merger affected the Presbyterian colonists the most. Already faced with religious discrimination, marred by economic disadvantages in both the business and political sectors ran by Catholic and Anglican agendas, when their original leases expired, it resulted in extreme rental increases they were not financially prepared for. Next was a drought from 1714 through 1719, which inflicted high cost of food. The famine of 1740 through 41 would cost about 400,000 lives, second greatest death toll and immigration flight compared to the late 1840s Great Famine. In 1716, sheep were dying from a disease recognized as rot. Two years later, smallpox devastated Ulster, following by three more years of unexplained winter fevers. These series of events forced many Scotch-Irish in making the decision to leave to the Americas, where land was abundant and affordable, having begun the mass exodus in 1717 and continued for the next 40 years. In the meantime, 
As the two Sir Michaels had decided to start over, their decision was actually very pragmatic. It was at this point when the Woods made the journey in 1724, eventually migrating to Virginia about 12 years later with Sir Michael Sr. leading his family of Presbyterian pioneers between 25 to 30 people in search of economic opportunities. The land in Lancaster became competitive while being dominated by Quakers with competing religious ideas. Plus, the majority of Quakers were in a strong position of pushing to abolish slavery. Many non-Quakers did not like this. In 1730, there were 4,000 enslaved people. However, by 1790, before complete abolishment and Pennsylvania being among the first few states to ban slavery, there was an estimate of about 10,000 enslaved people. The motivation for the Woods and Wallaces to relocate to Virginia may not have been entirely virtuous because in order to succeed in a heavy cash crop environment, slavery was considered a necessity and the Woods had no qualms taking advantage of it. The Busters would be no different. Upon the Woods' arrival into the wilderness, clearing land wasn't the only difficulties the settlers risked. When Lady Margaret accompanied her husband, Sir Michael Sr., to the Shenandoah Valley, she was the first Anglo woman to have been killed by the Iroquois-speaking peoples in 1742, including four other Anglo men. Amid the invasion of European settlers, squatting on Iroquois sacred hunting grounds, thusly driving out the buffalo that once grazed in the area while killing off and driving out other game in order to farm land, and friction of other territorial dispute with the Cherokee, this particular attack on the settlers was incited by indignation and alcohol. Did Lady Margaret personally provoke this singular band of Iroquois? Of course not. She and her husband, like many others on the frontier, hastily and neglectfully took control of land they thought they had the right to take over and thereby inadvertently placed themselves in the path of war. While reconstructing their lives in Goochland, it's obvious William Buster, Bustard, and the Woods family developed a close friendship. So close that William's oldest son, William Jr., married Jane Woods. His third oldest, John, married Elizabeth Woods. And his grandson, Claudius Woods Buster, married his first cousin, Isabella Woods. Despite the vast difference in their backgrounds, a bond between them bore more than just the proverbial fruit. Economical inspiration no doubt supported an affinity between them, and yet there had to have been something more in which William's two sons offered to the prestigious Woods family who abandoned Ireland. Whether their virtues were guided by similar ambition, faith, or utter grit, out of all the other settlers in the valley, these two families connected. This connection unveiled a history that once started out as a British tell, a tell of class division united, and could only unite during a period when the social environment upheld little boundaries because survival was more important than civility, and then transformed into an American one. One about redefining boundaries, even if for a short time before the class system continued to divide communities. Because both families, second generations, were raised in this transitional community, with it on the one hand allowing the merging of classes, but on the other, the expectation of rising above class and maintaining it was still considered competitive. Not everyone who flooded into the valley could afford land, even on credit, and not everyone could afford to keep its maintenance, thereby creating a competitive disposition. It was common, in fact, for many Virginians to be in debt due to the high stakes of producing cash crops. The expenses that laid into the investment of labor and the faith that land would yield crops consistently often took financial burdens. One example would be William Woods, the oldest son of Michael Jr., who mortgaged his property twice and finally sold it in 1774. He was not in the position to leave any wealth to his children who many would end up moving to Kentucky for prosperity. And despite that the language changed in America regarding social status, from gentry to gentlemen, from peasant to farmer, the level of manual labor continued to find one's honorable social status. This is where William's children would ascend from working on someone else's land to owning land, becoming one of the few who could be defined as the middle class or second. 